We've been going through the book of signs by David Jeremiah. And he tells a story about what took place on September the 22nd, 1967 at Wheaton College in suburban Chicago. Dr. V. Raymond Edmond, a revered Christian educator and devotional writer, returned to campus after an extended illness to preach in the auditorium named after him, Edmund Chapel. His subject was the presence of the king. He began by telling of an invitation he once received to visit the king of Ethiopia. He described in detail the preparations and the protocol that preceded his visit. And he spoke of the sense of majesty he felt upon speaking with the king. He spoke of walking down the aisle, pausing, bowing, and waiting to see if he would be allowed to proceed. It was a regal, glorious, intimidating, but wonderful experience, one that Edmund treasured. Then Edmund shifted gears and told the students, but I speak primarily of another king. This chapel is the house of the king. Chapel is designed to be a meeting on your part with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords himself. To that end, chapel is designed for the purpose of worship. Chapel is to be a time of worship, not a lecture, not an entertainment, but a time of meeting the King. Coming in, sitting down, sit down and wait in silence before the Lord. In so doing, you will prepare your own hearts to hear the Lord, to meet with the King. Your heart will learn to cultivate what the scripture says. Be still and know that I am God. Over these years, I have learned the immense value of that deep inner silence as David, the king, sat in God's presence to hear from him. A moment later, Edmund collapsed in the pulpit and went instantly into the presence of the very king of whom he was speaking. I'm sure you can feel my heart when I earnestly tell you that being a preacher and pastor myself, I would count it an honor to be called home while preaching, particularly while preaching on the subject of heaven. As David Jeremiah writes concerning the one there at Wheaton College in that chapel, talking about worship in heaven. That's our focus tonight, worship. And we're going to see, first of all, the context of worship in heaven. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. John is on the Isle of Patmos. He is exiled there. We have, we're entering a new part of the book of Revelation. Revelation has its own outline. I tell you, it's, it's the best when you can come across a book that provides its own outline for it, for the book. It's been debated for ages uh, concerning the book of Revelation. There are many different views concerning the book of Revelation, but Revelation itself gives an outline, if we would heed to it. It says in Revelation 1, dealing with the things which have been. That's the, the vision that John sees in Revelation chapter 1. And then the things which are. And that's Revelation chapters 2 and 3, dealing with the, the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And then Revelation 4, 1 to the end of the book in chapter 22, the things which shall be. So Revelation gives its own outline. It says this is the things that have already happened, Revelation 1, things which are currently Revelation 2 and 3. And then from Revelation 4, 1 to Revelation tw uh, chapter 22, all the way, it's future. It's future. In Revelation chapter 4, John says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Notice that first phrase, after these things. That is why many believe that the church would be gone because you don't see the church of the tribulation period. You don't see it mentioned. You have the church mentioned in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 in those seven letters. But then after these things, there's a, a transition, a different period of time. 
Now, there are some, if you've ever heard the word preterist, this is what it means. There are those that take a, quote, preterist view of Revelation, which that belief is that all the events of Revelation that we see as the tribulation period, judgments, they think that that already happened under Rome. So they put it back in history. Preterist, that's the idea of, the, of seeing Revelation that way. I reject that completely because of the literal interpretation of the book of Revelation. To take it literally, you would see this is yet future, as, as the, the Bible says. But John says there's a door standing open in heaven. Uh, I appreciate the book of signs and David Jeremiah, what he writes. I found myself with one slight disagreement with this chapter when he was talking about this, though he said this is the only, occur the only time that we see an open opportunity to see into heaven. There's actually another one I want you to see tonight. Isaiah chapter 6. This isn't the only time that you see the scene of the worship into heaven. I, I see what he's saying as far as, you know, the, the future aspect here and, and the, the worship that's going on. But there's actually another time in which Isaiah saw and what was going on in heaven and, the, and Almighty God on the throne. Isaiah chapter 6. It starts in verse 1 there, in the year of King Uzziah's death. King Uzziah had been overall a pretty godly king. And he had reigned about 55 years. So you had stability and a constant reign of this king. But this king has died. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. We were mentioning this a little bit in the Sunday school class this morning that the reality is we think about authority and, you know, we have in our government people are elected, what, to four years or in some cases six years. Uh, and even a Supreme Court justice may serve, you know, so many years on the bench, a life term, and various judges can be appoint, you know, federal courts for life and different things like that. But you think about 55 years, that's a long reign, isn't it? So you have all of this continuity, the stability of a reign, but then he dies. But look what the Lord shows. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. The good news is, the Lord sitting on his throne from eternity past to eternity future. His term never ends. He doesn't have a governing term that's over with the ruling of the power. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, life lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, woe is me. Notice this, Isaiah saying, all of this I'm seeing about the holiness of God, I recognize that I am undone or unclean, and I'm among men of unclean lips. Woe is me, for I am unclean. I'm undone. I am guilty. And when we get a true glimpse of God's holiness, we recognize our own sinfulness, how we fall short. How we, are, how we harbor sin, how we are guilty of sin, but the Lord is holy. Woe is me, for I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. King Uzziah died, but my eyes have seen the eternal King, the Lord of hosts. One of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? 
Then I said, here am I, send me. After the cleansing, then he was able to say, here am I, I'll go, send me. When we think about Isaiah. But John sees the door standing open in heaven, as we see in Revelation chapter 4. And then there's the voice that says, come up here. Come up here. So it says, the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Well, let's go to point two, the center of worship in heaven. What John is going to see and what he's going to report for us. John says, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he's going to try to describe for us what he saw. And he who was sitting was like, notice that word like, was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. I saw one sitting on the throne and he tried to describe and he would use these terms. On the throne, almighty God. David Jeremiah wrote that these references to God's heavenly throne speak to his sovereignty, authority, reign, and absolute power. When we study the throne of God in the book of Revelation, we're reminded that while events on this earth seem chaotic and often meaningless, you know, it is so helpful when we have chaos going on around us and, and chaos in the world and the various things, it's so helpful to stop and remember that God truly is on his throne. He's never stopped ruling. Man can be very cruel and doing uh, things. And you hear once in a while about uh, world ru rulers talking about, you know, if we can just get these nuclear arms or if we can just get this weaponry, if we get this and this and, and look up to all the power we'll have. But we're thankful that God is still sovereign and has absolute power. The things on this earth seem chaotic and often meaningless. There is one in the universe seated upon his throne, sovereign and in control. I love as Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 66, the last chapter of that prophecy, how he described God's throne. Isaiah 66. Thus says the Lord, thus says Yahweh, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. He is so far above, isn't he? Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. And then he says, where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. That's what Isaiah did earlier when he saw the Lord in Isaiah 6. He says, to the one on whom I will look, to him who is humble, who recognizes that we are made low before him. And contrite of spirit, that we, we see this in Psalm 51, that the one who has a humble or who is contrite of spirit, he will not despise. One who is saying, Lord, I am guilty sinner. I am guilty of sin. I am unclean. And who trembles at my word. Who hears, but who has an awe for the Lord. An awesome reverence. David Jeremiah in the study guide on the book of signs wrote the following, that all John in Revelation 4, 3, all John could do and all we can do is describe the impact of his presence, not his person. He writes, describing God is like describing wind. The best we can do in describe, 
is described the presence or impact or appearance of the wind, not the wind itself. We can talk about the impact of wind. Dale has seen many uh, disaster relief trips over the years that he saw the impact of heavy wind. Saw the impact, the results. But we can't really describe the wind itself. The effects of it. No wonder the word wind and spirit share the same word, pneuma, in the, in the Greek. So you think about John's description. He was saying he's like this in appearance, the glory of the Lord. But notice what was around the throne. In heaven, there's going to be, it's a complete circle. Around the throne is a rainbow. A rainbow. We see that in the latter part of verse 3. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. All that he saw. Well, let's go to the chorus of worship in heaven. In Revelation chapter 4, begins verse 4, praise to the one on the throne. In the scene that he's describing, around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. 24 elders clothed in these white garments. Charles Ryrie in the study Bible notes that it is likely that the 24 elders represent redeemed men who are glorified, crowned, and enthroned. He sees in heaven. And it says in verses 9 through 11, and when the living creatures, well, let me go ahead and, and read just verses 5 through 11 so we'll get the whole picture. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And those then there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf. The third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. They never cease to say that. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. So we see the praise to the one on the throne. But notice down in chapter 5, we're going to see worship of the Lamb. You might remember this is when he's weeping, there's found nobody worthy to open the seven sealed scroll, the title deed to the earth. No one's found worthy. But we can see in beginning verse 4 of Revelation chapter 5, I began to weep because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. 
And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And we had taken the book, the four living creatures, and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So there's the worship of the Lamb because of what Jesus Christ had done. He had purchased with his own precious blood the redeeming work. So the one we see God the Father in Revelation chapter 4, but then we see God the Son, the Lamb, as if he had been slain, Revelation chapter 5. You know what's amazing? We have an eternal reminder of Calvary. An eternal reminder of Calvary. We're there because he redeemed us with his precious blood. We would have the white garments, not because of our righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ applied to our accounts. To worship the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Oh, I can't carry a tune at all here on this earth, but I look forward to praising forever. I believe between here and heaven, <laughs> that tune will be just fine in worship to him. Worship of the Lamb. David Jeremiah in the book wrote, uh, this was quite an impactful statement about worship by William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury during World War II. He wrote the following, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God. That's what Isaiah was doing. That was what, when Isaiah was brought to the very reality of the holiness of God and what we see in Revelation, holy, holy, holy as Almighty God. To feed the mind with the truth of God. To purge the imagination by the beauty of God to open the heart to the love of God, to vote the will to the purpose of God. Worshiping the Lamb. On your outlines, point number four, the crescendo of worship in heaven. We see an acceleration of praise. As we start in chapter one, we're gonna see the, the number of doxologies as they increase. The doxologies, the descriptions about the Lord. As we start in Revelation chapter 1 and verses 4 to 6, the Bible says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and the dominion. So you have two there. To, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So you're going to see these doxologies increase as we go on. We saw in Revelation chapter 4, notice in verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. So he receives glory and honor and power, so we're increasing in the, in the doxologies. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 13, exalting the Lamb, every creature, created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing 
and honor and glory and dominion. See how we're adding as we go farther and farther in the praise forever and ever. When we get to chapter 7, verses 9 to 12, we're going to see the crescendo itself. We're going to see seven doxologies in verse 12. There's going to be a multitude, a great multitude saved during the tribulation period. You have the 144,000 Jewish witnesses. You have the two witnesses that, um, that you'll see in, in the book of Revelation. You have those that will be sharing concerning Christ. And there will be multitudes that will come to know God, that will know, come to know Christ all from all over, all around the world in the tribulation period. And in Revelation 7, this scene that we see in heaven, after these things I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the the throne and worship God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Seven doxologies be to our God forever and ever. Amen. I don't think it's by accident you see seven. Seven is a key number you see all the way through the book of Revelation. It's the number of completeness. What's the number of a man that's going to be uh, with the beast? It's short. It's not seven. It's six. 666, which is the number of a man. Seven is the number of completion. And you see the importance of sevens all the way throughout the book of Revelation. You have seven churches. You have the, in this doxology, I don't think it's by action, you have these seven doxologies. And you have all these different things, and you have the, the seven seals, and you have the, the seven uh, trumpet uh, judgments, you have the seven bowl, the, the bowl judgments, you have these going on in succession. All these various things, perfection, the seven spirits of God or the sevenfold spirit of God. God's number, seven, completion. All but man's was six. But even Satan's plan with the Antichrist comes short, doesn't it? Couldn't be seven. Couldn't be deity. Had to be a number of a man. So you think about the, the crescendo that happens of worship in heaven. Let's conclude this study with the contrast of worship in heaven. There's some important points David Jeremiah made in the book of signs that are very good, great application. And may they challenge us tonight in our love and our deep, in our worship of the Lord. First of all, worship is not about us. It's about Him. Worship isn't about us. It's about Him. You can go around the different world and the reality is children of God worshiping God in different ways in different cultures and different, different styles. When I was in Guatemala, their worship services were totally different than ours. There was a lot of marambas. You would hear the marambas and there was a lot of motion. There was a lot of uh, uh, very loud singing and, the, you know, and all these different things. But you know what the reality was? What's the intentions of their heart and the expressions? It may be expressed differently. It may be expressed differently. 
You can go to different parts of the United States and the worship services will be totally different. You can go in Southern Baptist churches across the different states and the worship styles may be completely different. But the desire was to worship the Lord. Worship is about Him. It's not about us. Sometimes we have to be careful that we don't leave a service and say, you know, I really didn't like this or I like this, but this, this part wasn't the best. You know, the whole aim, it's the audience of one. Lord, were you pleased? Was this acceptable in your sight? You know my heart. You have said that I am to come to you with clean hands and a pure heart. Isaiah said, oh, Lord, I'm undone. Woe is me. I'm an unclean. I have unclean lips. I live among those. I'm ruined. It's kind of like the man that Jesus talked about in the temple that wouldn't raise up his eyes. There's the, the Pharisee that says, Lord, aren't you glad that I'm not like this man? And aren't you glad that I'm not like that, fer that, that I'm not like that tax collector over there? but I tithe all these things, I do these things. Aren't you impressed, Lord, with all the things I do? And the one says, woe is me. He's beating his chest. Woe is me, a sinner. And the Bible says he went home justified. He went home justified. As I prepare to worship, do you realize that all week it's preparation for corporate worship? The individual worship is preparation for corporate worship. But it's a time, and, and it's a time of, that we come and that we are saying, Lord, as I want to lift my voices to you, you know my heart. I want to have a clean, a, I want to have clean hands and a pure heart. That's what you said in Psalm 15 and Psalm 24. And we see it. Uh, hinted by within James, we see in 1 Peter saying the same idea. Be holy even as I am holy. You are worthy and I want to be able to come singing praises from a pure heart. Clean hands. So worship is not about us, it's about Him. Worship is not about here, it's about there. Go to Colossians chapter 3. For years I've heard the statement about the danger of somebody being so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I think the opposite is true. And I think the greatest danger is that somebody is so earthly minded they're no heavenly good. Amen? <laughs> I'll have to be honest with you, I have never met a person yet that was so heavenly minded that they weren't any earthly good. I, I haven't met that person. I've heard that phrase, but I haven't met that person. I see in Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes and says, therefore, if, and that's the condition of since, it's not the if condition here, of, it, it's the idea of since you have been raised up with Christ. Where's your position? Since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Here's Paul's point. Positionally, you're already seated in the heavenly places. Amen? Even though practically we know we're here tonight in Westerville, we're here physically, but spiritually, positionally, we're already in Christ in the heavenly places. We're seated in the heavenly places in Him. Since we are seated in the heavenly places in Him, what are we to do? Keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, your affections, your life on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. The things that are on this earth are temporary. The things that are in heaven are eternal. So worship is not about here, it's about there. So when we are truly coming and worshiping the Lord, 
We're for focusing on where he is and because he is worthy. The word worship comes from worthship. It's the, an old word that, that's his worth. Oh, I love sometimes that, oh, come let us adore him. Not just at Christmas time, but it's true. Oh, come let us adore him. Worship is not about now, it's about then. Second Corinthians chapter 4, what Paul wrote. You may be here tonight and say, I'm just getting more and more aches and pains and I'm having more difficulty physically as I get older. Is there hope? Yes. Notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Paul writes, therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Though our outer man is decaying, even though a person may be declining in health, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For a momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So worship is really focusing our attention on the eternal. Focusing not on the temporal, but the eternal. And when we are thinking about the true worship, that is why it was so fascinating to see in the scriptures, the throne. Because the eternal God sitting on the throne. We may see a temporary period of chaos and, and times that we scratch our head and we might even wring our hands over and say, what is that going on? Why are all these changes? It's scary. We might hear some that have completely abandoned absolute truth and are just going off of a relativism or what I think is right is right. No. But the good news is, even though the, out, the outward, outer man may be decaying, the inner man is being renewed day by day because we're looking forward and our attention is not on the temporal but the eternal. And worship is not about one, it's about many. I mentioned earlier that we have private worship, preparing for corporate worship, but in heaven, what we see, there was always many. There was always many worshiping. So when we think about worship in heaven, worship is not about one. It's about the one on the throne, but not the one individual. It's about many people joining in, worshiping the Lord forever and ever and ever. It's true. When we've been there 10,000 years, we've only just begun. I can't picture 10,000 years, can you? But I think the hymn writer said exactly correct. When we've been there 10,000 years, We've only just begun to sing his praise. We're going to have a lot of time. There's some Bible characters I'm looking to forward to talking to. Maybe been after, maybe when we've been there 10,000 years, we can get around to different ones. Maybe say, hey, I didn't have understanding of this passage right now, but I have understanding in heaven. I think those questions that we always think about, 
I think they're going to be gone as soon as we see Jesus. I think when we see him, and we are going to be focusing on him, his presence. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, indeed, Lord, we ask that may we be very conscious that worship, it's not about us. but you are the object of our worship. And so, Lord, may the focus not be, what do I think about this? But what do you? Indeed, Lord, worship is not about here. We're challenged to have our heart focus, our mind set upon you, set upon heaven. That indeed affects our life here. But our focus on you. Now worship, it's not about now. It's about then. about eternity. And Lord will join the multitudes for eternity, worshiping you for your worthy. Lord, we know we've just scratched the surface on these passages, but we can clearly see the focus of worship to you the activity in heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you opened the door. You invited John to come up and to see. And as he recorded for us that we could understand you are on your throne. You are the sovereign Lord. We love you. Oh, may our heart focus be upon you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.